Today, I am joined by my friend, the uh, musician, composer, producer, sound designer, uh, all things electronic extraordinaire, uh, Rob Kelly. And you aren't our first international guest because my co-host is, you know, from Turkey, but uh, you are the first guest joining us from another country. So Rob's coming to us from London, England, which is super exciting. And uh, looks like we both have some daylight at the same time here, which is also cool. Yep. Yeah, we do. You know, yeah, We're in this like- I haven't got much left. Probably like one hour and it will be dark. I'll be switching <laughs> lights on. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, thanks for give, uh, providing me with this playlist, which is music that um, honestly was pretty new to me, even though some of it shouldn't be. I was like kind of ashamed actually in some of the parts where I was like, <laughs> I should probably know this since this is basically like dead center in my like generations, like music that I should know. But uh, there's all sorts of interesting stuff on here that ranges like from all sorts of genres and uh, runs really yeah. runs the gamut. But uh, yeah, like tell us, uh, what were you thinking about when you put this together? Is it, you know, music that you love or is it uh, music that you're interested in right now or music that you've like sort of found interesting over the years? Because it does have like a, a range from like the early 90s. Yeah, it to certainly does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think I think you gave me the uh, the incredibly um, specific brief of music that I liked. I was like, <laughs> OK, then. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it's, you know, um, it's some of it's probably more of a, an electronic angle uh because I, I started um well i think the reason this came about is because i sent you that little snake piece and so that that was kind of the, the trigger of it and and um so i chose things with that as a sort of starting point so that and then and then there's some completely random things that i'm just like well i like that and i want to talk about it so <laughs> yeah a mixed mixed bag yeah yeah for sure um, definitely you hear the electronic influence come through like obviously there's a i mean you can see behind you there's a love of, of synthesizers and modular <laughs> synthesizers and analog synthesizers although i'm sure there's plenty of like digital manipulation going on in some of these tracks as well yeah, but yeah, also yeah. uh i would say maybe like a love of like break beats from the 70s and stuff there's a thread through a lot of this even the music that is being performed in the studio like the primus uh track or something there's still a sound like a, a drum kit sound that i think right. is related to that kind of 70s like funk breakbeat um era yeah, um, yeah i guess i guess so yeah which yeah, i thought I'm, was kind of cool I'm a, I'm a bass player but i've been trying to get my learn my way around a kit and um yeah so the, the, the drums and rhythm programming and all of these all yes yeah, probably quite a, a strong strong feature throughout them yeah yeah. So uh, tell yeah. us about this this little snake track. I didn't yeah. know this artist and a super interesting person. Yeah, really amazing. Um, I didn't know him at all until I think probably discovered him or found out about him about a year ago. And it was via um, an Amon Tobin Facebook post because um, they'd collaborated together on a piece um, uh, for Amon Tobin's Two Fingers um, moniker that he does a lot of his more sort of beat driven and electronic stuff. And Little Snake was on one of those tracks. And so I just listened to this EP on YouTube and just thought it was absolutely amazing. It was like such interesting, uh, you know, sonic techniques. And it was unlike really anything I suppose I'd heard before. It's like, well, this has really felt very new ground, you know. Uh, and he's really, really young. He's a super young guy from, um, it's in Alberta in Canada. Uh, and there's very little information about him around. So I, just, I found one interview that I read earlier, but there's, there's not that much about you know information about him or, or what techniques he uses or how he does it but i just really loved like the the contrast and how sort of um the way he would go from such sort of fierce and hard beats into very reverberant almost classical choral textures and use one to cut up the other and there's just like a, a lovely precision to it but it's also really really random and it, it's not like there's a groove that flows all the way through it's just this constantly evolving sonic madness and it's just like whoa i'd love to know more about how he mixes it and uh, what processes he uses i'm sure there's more info out there but i've just got to go digging yeah that's um, pretty fascinating yeah, just, from Can yeah. canada like from uh calgary i had no idea um which is actually not that far from where i grew up but right and there's also and when i found that out there's another artist from there named david berezin who's uh teaches electronic music actually in manchester at the university of manchester in the uk right. mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh you should check him out. Very similar aesthetic as far as like very sound designy, like very right. yeah. uh, intense, you know, like the gestural mm -hmm. language is very intense and like, you know, kind of does it, it's very specific, but it does come across as sort of like uh, very kind of random and free or almost improvised or something. But uh, yeah, it's pretty hardcore. And I definitely am interested in these artists who are kind of like in this world of 
sound design slash composition and you know even like contemporary film scores like i don't, I don't know if you've seen tenant yet with uh, the um, ludwig uh, gornson soundtrack but very similar as well you know it just is like right. is this yeah. you know like a, a film score or is this like sound design it's like hard to tell what's happening yeah. in some well, of the scenes where, but where the join is yeah super uh, cool. to my shame i haven't se- i haven't seen it yet but like, it's definitely on the list so well you have to turn yeah, the subtitles on because like the the <laughs> <laughs> the the, the uh, mix is like the the uh, dialogue's like inaudible, but uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> but this is a good transition to obviously the Amon Tobin track next, um, yeah. because yeah. these two obviously you discovered this artist through Amon Tobin, um, who's an artist I had known of from you know back in the early aughts. Uh, mm-hmm. But there's obviously clearly some connections here in the aesthetic and things like that, especially in the middle Definitely, of this yeah. Journeyman yeah. track. Um, yeah. yeah. But how did you come across Amon Tobin's work? Um. I think, um, I mean, I yeah, I, I sort of first heard his stuff probably in the 90s um, when he was doing more sort of drum and bassy and hip hop stuff and, you know, a lot of drum and bass but that was sampling jazz. Um, so I definitely knew his music back then, probably when around the time I was at uni. Um, and always, I just always liked it. Every time I heard anything new from him, I was like, oh, that's really interesting. And then he did the, the Foley Room album where he was, again, using lots and lots of field recorded sounds and... Um, you know, um, evolving away a bit from sort of beat driven and 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 more sort of you know sampling um, and jazzy stuff to being more experimental and more more about you know capturing very very small sounds and processing them and using them to to generate beats and textures and so that that album was was very interesting and then I saw him I was lucky enough to see him on when he did the ISAM tour and it was at this amazing um, but ultimately doomed little music festival in East London called um, Block. And the lineup was just crazy. They booked uh, Steve Reich performed live. They had um, MF Doom played, um, wow. uh, Eamon Tobin, uh, Square Pusher, I think, played there. It was just like a, just a list of all these amazing artists that I was really, that was a, a, again a sort of classical, contemporary classical and electronic crossover. And I saw him do the ISAM tour where he was using, he was inside of a structure and they were using massive, huge, powerful projectors to do projection mapping uh, that was really, really tightly synced visuals that worked with the music. And I saw it on this huge stage through this massive PA and I was right down the front and it yeah, just melted my brain, <laughs> you know, just so amazing. So amazing. Oh, that's amazing. And, um, yeah, that's a nice, uh, that, um, like, uh, I've only seen one artist and I think it was a Tom York solo show that actually had a video like designer on stage doing live visuals right. that were tightly synced mm-hmm. and improvised and mm. it brings like so much more to the experience. I'm surprised yeah. that more people don't do that in a more kind of like, um yeah, you know yeah. like artful way i mean of course people design lighting and stuff like that to go with their live shows but having some yeah. having some visuals that are like very tightly synced up integrated and, yeah 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 i really i've always been really interested in like visual music and i've, I've worked on a few projects like that where the, the the what's going on in in the music directly dictates what's happening with the imagery and you know maps very very closely and I think there's still lots of really interesting stuff to uh, to explore there. And as you say, it seems, I mean, it's obviously it's expensive and time consuming and difficult. And the projectors he had for this tour, they were just, you know, projectors the size of a car and he had to have two of them, plus I think a spare. And, you know, I think, I think the whole thing must have cost just a crazy amount of money, uh, but it was so impressive and, um, and very beautiful to look at. And it just synced so well with the music and, He'd obviously spent a long time working on how they would do the projection mapping. There's some videos of it and stuff on YouTube. Um, but yeah, it was yeah, a very, cool. very, uh, very amazing thing to, to see that was. Yeah. Well, tell us about the, the Square Pusher portion of this uh, yeah. festival and okay. talk about these next yeah. uh, two tracks. <laughs> so these are both from a very early album called Hard Normal Daddy. And I think he was maybe like 19 or 20 when he wrote it. And again, I found this video on YouTube a while ago of just him and his flat in Rumford, I think he lived in, in Essex, which is near where I grew up. Almost without computers, you know, he was using an eight track reel to reel tape machine and a sampler and he must, I didn't, he, you couldn't see what sequence he was using, using, but I presume he must have been using something like early Cubase or something like that. But yeah, I first heard this album in my friend's garden and I was just like, what the <laughs> hell is this? I have never heard anything like this before. And uh, there are two quite contrasting tracks. So the first one is Cooper's World, which is silly, but it's just so amazing. Like the drum programming in that, that was like, that was what, 
you know got my attention as like oh my god what is happening with these drums and just like the detail of how he programs the snare and all the ghost notes and uh, you can see why he was called square pusher because i guess he spent a lot of time pushing around squares <laughs> to uh, to make that stuff but it's just it's so musical and so interesting and clever and very very it's like it's really natural and the sort of thing you might imagine a drummer would do but also it's totally programmed and synthetic and it's at that sort of meeting point of those two things which i think is is amazing and it's just like kind of silly 70s chase music funk basically totally. wild, wild guitar and stuff but it's so great and 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 also you just think well that must be completely unplayable but i've seen him play a few times recently where he'd had a, a live um uh, i think four piece band um and he toured a sort of a best of of square push and stuff and they played a lot of this stuff live and it's just like oh my god it's um, kind of come back around like it's interesting because there's a a lot of artists now like um snarky puppy or even like someone like jacob collier or yeah. you know maybe like wolf peck or somebody there there is kind of like this it's in the air right now this kind of music that is kind of fun and kind of kitschy and, yeah and yeah, but yeah also very virtuosic like highly virtuosic yeah. um yeah. but uh just i don't know kind of like satirical or something but uh, i totally love the the like game show 70s vibe uh, there's a yeah, show called people's great. court in the united states i don't know if you've ever seen this but i immediately yeah. had this like vibe of being on people's court when this track started which was super right. fun um, <laughs> okay it also just like you know it's very 90s which i love too and that's also kind of coming back around like there's almost like a an eq setting if i had one that was just like 90s <laughs> <laughs> and like you know right. i'm thinking of like prodigy and these groups you know that just like has this like uh vibe to it and especially the next the the next track like uh chin hippie the same same sort of thing yeah. where it's just like this like you know uh break beat like on acid through like glitch and bit crushing and all sorts of stuff and uh yeah it just has this like it just puts me straight back in the 1990s which i think right is overlooked and often actually pretty amazingly creative yeah um, certainly on loads of amazing electronic music from that time and i think you know it's interesting that it was kind of before digital audio workstations and um, people had them but they were very very basic so if you wanted to make electronic music you might have a sequencer sure like you know a um, notator or cubase or whatever but it was all about programming samplers and people would just spend a lot of time in front of hardware samplers which were quite fiddly and annoying to program but actually once you got into them you could do so much you know they're very creative tools i think in a way because they were limited and now you have software samplers that obviously run on your workstation, uh, like Contact and so forth. They're amazingly powerful, but people don't seem to spend the same amount of time uh, preparing and making sort of detailed sounds and building their own things. It's just so easy to load up a preset and then tweak it a bit. Whereas when I used to use Akai samplers, I would really spend ages, like, because, you know, the RAM is so precious. You're just sampling <laughs> tiny little fragments and being really, really careful and really being very specific about what you choose. So I think the, the the limitation of the technologies that can actually be really, really creative. And I think, yeah, that time when samplers were just, you know, 90s, they were these amazing new and creative tools. And you can really hear that in, in a lot of this stuff. Yeah. And so, cool. yeah, the Chin Hippie one is kind of the opposite of the Cooper's world. I mean, they're both, sort of, you know, obviously rhythm driven, but, but it's just like it's just another it's just a mad savage assault on your ears of just all these relentless, crazy noises and i have no idea how he did it and uh you know but i, I just loved I mean, that whole album there are so many different styles and and you know different um sort of um flavors of music on it. and yeah that one is uh it's it's relentless but i like it sounds great in the car super loud yeah. <laughs> yeah that's awesome so that those you know those first four tracks i think make a nice little kind of like introduction to yeah. you know yeah um, mm -hmm. but then this next track kind of a, a, a left turn as far as like style and stuff. But I'm wondering, yeah, yeah. I don't know who this artist is. Um, and it obviously points towards a lot of music that I love, a lot of like 60s and 70s minimalist music. And okay. um, cool. yeah. there is a kind of like folk quality to it as well, which is yeah. interesting. Indeed, um, yes. But uh, who so would, I, you, can you tell me more about this this artist? So um, I, uh, I I had to sneak these on here. So the uh, the band is Teleplasmist, and the song is a boy called Conjurer, and um, they're they're friends of mine. So um, <laughs> uh, my friend Mike, uh, Michael York, and Mark Pilkington, and they're they're a, a duo. Um, and it's as as you say, um, it's quite electronic and analog synth based. They both use these amazing, very rare synths called. Um, uh, Synton Phoenixes, of which very few were made, and they both got one. Um, and they also use you know, Moog modular stuff. Um, 
and uh, I saw Mike not so long ago and he's got a, um, uh, a Moog Matriarch as well, which is very lovely, newish Moog synth. Um, and um, so this, that this was from their second album. Uh, and as you say, it also includes sort of folk, more folky elements. Uh, Mike um, is an amazing bagpipe player and he also, he makes pipes and a very, very good um, player of reed instruments. And so you can hear some of those pipes on the track. Okay, okay, okay. And, I was um, wondering if that was like real or not. I was, because uh, the way it's blended in the electronic sound, I was like, I th yeah, think that's a yeah. bagpipe, but maybe it's yeah. just a cool synthesizer. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, they, they do fuse like sort of field recordings with um, analog synths, but also with real instruments and, and drones. And uh, yeah, I love that combination of it and how it almost feels, even though it's predominantly electronic, it feels very folky. And I think that's really interesting. And um, yeah, and yeah I, sure. I, I had the pleasure of working on it. So I, I mixed that album for them and I did the one before as well. And it's always, it's like a mad journey working with those guys, <laughs> lots of experimentation. And uh, yeah, they're, it's really fun, really, really fun and very re rewarding to, to, to work on. So. Wow, crazy. Yeah. Sounds great, man. That's awesome that you worked on it. Cool. Um, Thanks. And this, uh, um, Schwing track next, uh, yeah. also with the, the, the tie in the kind of Moog theme with the Moog Acid yeah. Yeah. album. Yeah. Uh, again, has this kind of great 70s like breakbeat vibe. Uh, uh -huh. Again, with the analog synthesized kind of leads in it. But I was super yeah. into like the guitar loop in this and uh, this idea of like it kind of like a string, the low E string or something being just like tuned up and tuned down with the, the tuning bag, right. which I thought was mm -hmm. just like a cool has a cool vibe and you know like a very interesting groove to it that it creates um and who yeah i don't know these artists either actually I had not okay heard them before. um so jean-jacques perry um is pretty new to me well I, I i only discovered him through this album um but i think he's pretty well known in france he was um you know somebody that um uh did a lot in the 60s with early synths and so on and sort of brought them into pop music and so on so i think he's, he's a pretty big name in france i believe um, but the, his collaborator is the excellent Luke Vibert, who's a um, British electronic musician from Cornwall, um, who grew up with Aphex Twin and they're, you know, the uh, contemporaries and were on the same labels and so on. And I've always been into Luke Vibert stuff. I just, I love the way he programs grooves and it's, again, it's sort of slightly silly and, but really clever and really interesting use of drums and rhythms. Um, and I discovered him. Um, on an album called Stop the Panic, which was a collaboration with a um, uh, lap steel guitar uh, player called BJ Cole. And, and I, I bought that album when I was in America. I was driving around San Francisco and I went to a shop and bought it and put it on in the car. And I was just like, oh, this is fantastic. <laughs> Back when you bought CDs. Um, and uh, yeah, so I traveled. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I found this. So I was just listening to a bunch of Luke Vibert's stuff and found that Moog Acid album on, on Spotify. I hadn't heard of it before, but oh yeah, yes, I love it. It's great. There's some really crazy, interesting stuff on there. So I like the way he finds interesting musicians that he wants to work with and collaborates. And yeah. Yeah, very cool. I'm gonna have to dig into his Lots catalog. I had no idea. Um because I also I, I mean I love Apex Twin, but I, I can't believe I didn't know uh his music, but I'm gonna check it out. Yeah. Uh, Loads of good stuff. Yeah, check out the uh, Stop the Panic album. It's really, really cool. Yeah. Nice. I'll try to make a note Let's of that and put some of these links in the YouTube comments and stuff like that. Okay. Um, and of course, the next track is classic. Uh, you know, this is one of the greatest sounding records of all time. Uh, <laughs> Do you think so? Yeah. Uh, it just sounds so good. It's so creative yeah. and just every Doesn't sound it, is so yeah. specific yeah. and yeah. beautiful and like nothing feels superfluous. Everything feels so intentional and yeah. even all the tiny little details they make with like how they produce the sound of the the vocal recording and all that sort of stuff is just like it sounds very contemporary to me actually i feel like there's a lot of right. stuff now yeah. that people are making that sounds like this and i've obviously yeah. followed this band for a while and i i love the even the film scores that jeff barrow's done for like annihilation and ex machina yeah. Yeah. and i don't know yeah. they're just yeah. super interesting people but yeah tell us about this track on this list uh yeah you know again i think i heard this it's interesting you say it's one of the best sounding records ever made because it's like there's so much about that record that is so lo-fi and so crunchy and that sort of breaks a lot of the norms of how you might traditionally go about you know um well they, they did some extremely interesting um stuff with um using kit in ways it wasn't designed to be used. So for example, they do like Dolby noise reduction units, which are supposed to remove hiss from tape, but actually use it and put the vocal through them. 
to give it that sort of unique and slightly everything's just on the edge of distortion and really extreme use of compression so compressing the hell out of things printing it to tape and then compressing it again and printing it to tape and they would bounce stuff around between multi-tracks lots and lots of times to deliberately degrade it and it's all it's so mushed and compressed but it's so beautiful it's like that's real skill and art in how to use a compressor to do something musically new with it and you can particularly hear it on the drums in this track and just the way it pumps and the whole you feel like you're just sort of pushing and pulling and uh yeah I, I, yeah it was a, when i first heard the dummy album again i guess in the 90s it just it blew me away it was yeah as for yeah. so many people and no, yeah totally. i really enjoyed sort of listening to the you know the, the the following two albums um they're quite different but i love them as well and i saw a hint they did um paul said did um, a facebook post recently bizarrely um saying um about soundcloud's new um royalty model which um pays streaming royalties more directly to the artists according to you know what the what the, the listener listens to rather than so you the artists that you actually listen to you're streaming if you subscribe or you pay for it that it goes directly to those artists so a much fairer sort of royalty model for streaming and um and they they, they did a post talking about this and uh interestingly the little teaser at the end was like uh, we look forward to working with soundcloud in the future like are you doing more is there more stuff so yeah maybe maybe they they will still make some some new music you never know i think they will so i hope yeah. so yeah but cool. yeah no they're amazing man beth gibbon's voice is just fantastic and as yeah. you say um jeff's sort of production and adrian utley again it was like they, you know they, maybe there's a bit too much of a recurring theme in this playlist but um it was you know adrian utley was a jazz jazz and blues musician and Jeff was obviously you know, came from more of a hip hop and electronic background and sampling and so on, and um, and then so those two elements came together very in an interesting way. And then you know Beth's voice and the way she sings and her performances are just like oh my god, yeah. so amazing, so, awesome. Yeah. And speaking so, of performances, you know, next we got the uh, the, tw <coughs> oh, the yes. twenty ensemble, which of course is how we met through our uh, mutual friend Tron Madsen who was yeah, the yeah. artistic director Sorry. of the Bit 20 Ensemble, which is a contemporary group in um, Bergen, Norway, where me and Rob met actually uh, yeah, in indeed. 2019, which I'm glad we got yeah. to travel in before everything got changed. Yeah, yeah, me too. It was such, such an amazing weekend that, yeah, their, their 30th <laughs> anniversary and so much good music and interesting stuff. And one super, of your pieces was played there, wasn't it? Yeah, super fun, man. But yeah. I love this yeah. album that they put out, this Exotica album of music by Oyvind Torvin. Um, I think this was actually one of the like freshest takes in like contemporary classical music that I've heard in a long time. Uh, I've never yeah. heard really yeah. anything like it. Uh, of course, yeah. the the you know the stuff that's in it, like the kind of exotica, like Esquivel uh, stuff, uh, and that meets kind of like you know the modular synth kind of you know bleepy bloopy uh, stuff from the fifties and sixties or something. Yeah. Uh, but there's just sort of like an incredibly inventive and playful and fun energy on this record and. Yeah. Yeah. highly recommend the whole thing but absolutely this yeah. track in particular what what are your uh thoughts on selecting the the starry night uh well i mean it, i think the whole album like if you wrote it if you wrote some down a description of this album of going right well it's going to be very schmaltzy romantic strings and this sort of exotica vibe but there's going to be loads of totally bizarre sound design and bleeps and other weird noises and there's bits of field recording and stuff in there you just be like well this sounds ridiculous this is never going to work this is silly uh but it's just so great isn't it and the performance i love the, the string playing and the sound of the ensemble you could i think they did it all very quickly you know tron did tell me i think it was only they only had two or three days recording maybe um and it just blows me away that they did the whole album so well so quickly and you can really hear how much they're enjoying it you can just hear the players loving it and they're playing this kind of crazy bizarre experimental but quite silly music and that just sounds great it's just really really fun and um yeah it's like it's obviously quite um tongue-in-cheek retrospective looking back but it's also very modern and, and futuristic and you know, I, I really like that yeah. Totally, totally. Um, so the, the the Primus track here, John the Fisherman, this is like really <laughs> going back to my high school days. Now you're like, I was right. very yeah, firmly yeah. into like hard rock, metal, all this kind of stuff when I was in, okay. in high yeah, school yeah. in the 90s yeah. and uh, even in middle school, even in grade school, I was totally into Ozzy Osbourne and these people. But um, yeah. <clears throat> this, this track is cool because obviously it's a, you know, 1990, probably the earliest thing on this list. And um, I've always loved 
the unusual quality of Primus, especially obviously the way that Les Claypool plays bass is very unusual, yeah. and also the yeah, guitar yeah. player plays like yeah. writes very strange guitar riffs. <clears throat> they're they're not yes, definitely. They're not necessarily you know like uh, like anybody else. They're very like bendy yeah. and slidey and you know strange. Um, yeah, yeah. But I have uh, I did have a chance to see Primus in concert once in the '90s in Montana, where I grew up uh, in Missoula, awesome. Montana. And then I actually yeah. also got to uh, hang out with the drummer one time, uh, Tim Alexander, when he left yeah. the band. In the okay. late 90s, he yeah. left the band for a little while, and he was playing with a group called Laundry, and they were playing like tiny little, you know, they were playing like bars, basically. And so he right. played, this, played yeah. this bar in Missoula, and there was, you know, I was one of, you know, 10 people there or something. And so he was just right. hung, hung out with us, and we, we got drunk with Tim Alexander. But uh, yeah. uh, so this is a lot of like good memories for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of Primus. Well, um, I'd assume if you're a bass player, then. Yeah, that was it. Like, I, you know, I, I found, found out about Primus when I was you know, quite a young teenager, probably when I was 15, 16. Um, probably either through my brother or my friend Dan, who was also a bass player. And yeah, I sort of came to it because of Les Claypool's amazing bass playing. But all three of them are just such fantastic musicians and i really love the drums yeah tim alexander herb he's known as well isn't he <laughs> uh like the way he plays and the precision of how he plays and the grooves and everything out it all locks in with the crazy crazy fretless six string bass playing with a whammy bar and <laughs> lunatic vocals it's just so it's so bizarre isn't it but it really works and it's just great and they can do it live and you're just like oh my god amazing players uh so just like yeah the sort of silliness of it but also the energy and as a, a kid, I was always trying to figure out how on earth he played those bass lines. And I could kind of play John the Fisherman badly at one point in my life. I don't think I can now. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, all mad tapping and stuff. Digging the digging the dig 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 and all that stuff. Oh no, that's, that's Jerry's a race car driver. Different one. <laughs> um, and also, I, I have a, a, a funny memory of uh, my mum freaking out and telling me to turn down my uh, stereo listening to Primus when I was a kid. So it always always makes me laugh. Yeah, that's awesome. Great right. band, and and still going and still doing the thing. And Les Claypool really? has a um a vineyard now. He's well into his wine making. He's got an amazing vineyard in uh, in California. Yeah, oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> but uh, we'll we'll visit someday. Next time you're you're yeah. traveling to San Francisco, we'll I hope so. Yeah, throw in some Primus CDs and yeah. drive around to some vineyards. <laughs> the uh, so this next next track, I didn't know. Uh, I don't know who Ruth Barrett is. Um, but okay. this kind of begins. I would say there's some some cinematic strings on some of these tracks, which I've sort of put together with, with this track and then like Bjork and the boards of Canada yeah, and yeah. even the, the bit 20 ensemble, there is something about yeah, like these kind yeah. of the cinematic strings that come up in this playlist, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Tell us more about Ruth Barrett or yeah. how you came um, across this. So Ruth is, um, she's a, another friend. Uh, she's a um, British uh, film and TV composer. Um, she uh, works on a lot of um, British and, and American dramas um, and I've known Ruth for a long time we've worked together on quite a, a few different things uh, she's a fantastic composer again also very very into her electronics um, and um, her husband is also an excellent musician and they, you know they're mad into their, their modular synths and so on um, and I've always just admired Ruth's writing and composing and she's lovely to work with and um, this was from a project we did it, um, together a few years ago I, I also mixed this one um, and um, the strings were recorded at uh, Air Studios. Um, and uh, yeah, I just really like the, uh, it's from an album called Cinematic Beauty that was on the, it's production music for KPM. Um, and I just really like the atmosphere of it. And I like the sort of very fast flowing arpeggiated pianos and how they sort of mix with the synth parts and, and the lush strings. And <clears throat> I've seen it on the TV a few times. It was used in um, a program about space exploration a while ago. And I was like, yes, that's exactly the sort of thing I hoped this might get used for. Um, and yeah, just it's, a, yeah, that's, you know, I just wanted to, um, to have something from Ruth on there. And um, uh, it's, it, yeah, reminds me of Happy Times, mixing that with her quite a long time ago. Um, yeah, I think that was probably maybe around 2009 or 2010 that we did that album um but uh, yeah yeah she's a and she composes in many many different styles she did um a um, series called bodyguard over here it's a british drama which is now on netflix that was very very successful and that's fantastic score lots of really fierce nasty synths and interesting use of water phones and that sort of thing and cool yeah very almost industrial sort of thing so whereas this one's obviously 
more cinematic and peaceful and nice. But yeah, she's she's very versatile and does lots of nice. I will definitely check stuff. that out if it's on. Uh, Netflix. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, yeah, yeah, and this you know the, the cinematic strings I was sort of tying into the the hyper ballad track by Bjork, but there's also an interesting tie-in from the track before, which is this Ali Farkatori and Tumani Diabata uh, track. Yeah, because yeah. Tumani Diabata actually played Cora on York's Volta album. Oh, I didn't know that. So, right, like yeah. there's a kind of an interesting tie-in there, which I was like, oh, that's yeah, okay. pretty interesting. Um, that's great. And actually, right. this this track, this Ruby track from this album, yeah. which was released posthumously, I think, after Ali Farkatori had um, passed away. Uh, I think I got the most joy actually of discovering this record and looking at uh, YouTube videos of them playing live and just like the virtuosity, right. yeah, yeah. especially of the yeah, yeah. playing yeah. is like, yeah. it's like unbelievable. I don't know. Like, how yeah, my I, mind, absolutely. But... I, I just listened to this album over and over and over and over. I got, you know, I will never ever get bored of this album. I could just listen to it five times in a day and still want to put it on again. It's so lovely. And, um, uh, yeah, I, I think the Cora is a very beautiful instrument. I really like the sort of harp family of instruments and yeah, just the expression in how he plays it. It's so lovely. And um, it reminds me of, uh, there's a, um, a festival in the UK, though they have it around the world um, called WOMAD, World of Music and Dance, which is a sort of a world music festival uh, that was originally started by Peter Gabriel um, to sort of showcase um, talents and musicians from around the world. And so they, it's kind of based in the UK, but they also have it in Australia and New Zealand and in Europe and so on. Um, and um, I've seen many excellent Cora players um, at WOMAD over the years, and they do like Cora workshops where you can go along and learn to play. And the artists will come out and talk about their culture and their music. And um, there's an a area called Foods of the World there, whereas uh, they, the artists play, and they'll do a gig, but they also cook. They will cook you food and show you how they cook their national you know favorite dishes and they bring it out and give it to you and then they go back and play some music and it's <laughs> well mad it's just such a great fantastic festival and i've i've discovered so much lovely music there and i the sort of world music is a bit of a weird term i've always thought because it doesn't really mean anything does it? it's like well music from the world <laughs> from the planet earth cool because you can see like a you know i've seen amazing djs there i've seen blues musicians i've seen three women from Siberia dressed as owls making bird song noises and you know just the range and breadth of stuff that you discover at WOMAD and they really pull out the stops to bring really really interesting artists from all over the world and and the staging and the lighting and everything is fantastic and um, yeah so this this track reminds me of many many happy times at that festival and I just bought a ticket because it's been it's it's uh, it's probably going to happen. They just announced they're going to try and do it this summer, despite all the lockdown Amazing. and so on. So cool. Fingers fingers crossed that's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. speaking of like uh, uh, Bjork, this next track, like obviously an artist that has always surrounded herself with people from all over the place, and I think that's one yeah. of her superpowers yeah. is like finding interesting people and collaborating yeah. with them yeah. and getting them mm -hmm. to showcase on her on her tracks. Um, but uh, this uh, this track is like really also very near and dear to me because I yeah. I played the post album like I played it yeah, out a million times. A period of time yeah, where yeah. I just yeah, that's yeah. all I had in my I had this like '90s Toyota pickup truck and that was like the album <laughs> that was in that car and it was yeah, in that car yeah. for like years and I listened to it on repeat over and over and over and over again. Yeah, I eventually yeah. crashed crashed that car. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> was it Bjork's fault? Were you distracted? <laughs> The first track does, you know, jam pretty hard. Um, so it's possible. It's possible. Yeah. But um, I think, uh, do, you, do you know Fiona Apple? You probably come across of her. Of course, yeah. Yeah. Uh, she's she's responsible for nearly make me, making me crash my car on many <laughs> occasions because, like, her stuff is just so great. And that's often on in the car. And I'm always missing turnings or nearly <laughs> driving into lorries. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, Hyper Ballad. I mean, it's a bit of a, definitely a bit of a sentimental early days Bjork one. But yeah, the post album is fantastic. And, I think you know she's such a diverse artist that has done so she has so many different phases and always inventive and always doing new things and always experimenting and always on the cutting edge and I think with artists like that where they're constantly moving forwards and breaking new ground and doing new stuff that's amazing but it, it's almost easy to forget the early stuff and go well the early stuff was amazing as well you know so nice to go back to it and yeah it's a lot, lots of happy memories from that album also and yeah it's just really interesting I love the you know how the delicacy of how she sings and her voice and how but it also and the tracks very sort of delicate 
in a way, but it's also got that sort of techno driving electronic feel to it. And yeah, totally. It's uh, from a long way in the past, but still feels futuristic to me in a way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That, yeah, timeless. The I mean, there's just so it? much yeah. Yeah. aesthetically, just so on top of it all the time, like really yeah. Yeah. engaged with all the different kinds of movements that are happening and mixing them in interesting ways. And um, yeah. the next band, Boards She's of Canada, I must say, I don't. I don't know well, but I have millions of people, millions, as a right. slight exaggeration, yeah. have been telling me that I need yeah, to know yeah. this band. Yeah. And somehow yeah. I've, I've you do, you do. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Chris. Come on. Uh, so yeah, I another, enjoyed another, this. Yeah. Right. Um, so they're, they're um, another really interesting, I think they're from Scotland. Yeah, I think they, are. they live in Scotland. Yeah. Uh, and they've been around a long time. Again, they sort of not much, not that much known about them. They keep themselves to themselves, and they don't release that much music. But when they do, you know, it's just great. There's, there's not that many albums, but they are so good and so interesting. And I've always, yeah, just been super into them. And for me, they sort of sit alongside um, Aphex Twin and Orbital and Square Pusher and Luke Viber and kind of in a similar sort of part of my brain musical growing up when I discovered them. And this video I chose because the video for it freaked me out so much that I didn't hardly couldn't really sleep. I watched it like quite late at night and then it just melted my brain so much that I was like, is, is this for real? Did I really see this? And I, so the, the video is worth digging out because it's footage from the first guy, oh, I've forgotten his name, but he was the, basically the first guy that effectively went into space. So, you know, you think of Yuri Gagarin and spaceships and all that, but oh no, this guy was uh, an American military test pilot and he went into space in a balloon, in a basket, <laughs> like a, a wicker basket, basically. And they, they didn't know if he would die or not. And he was up for it. So they just, it's like a weather balloon and it went right through the atmosphere and through the stratosphere uh, as high as it could possibly go. And then he just jumps out and jumps to the planet Earth. And he's got a camera on his head and there's a camera on the basket. And a, there's, I think there's three cameras and you see him falling and you just see the curvature of the Earth. And they're like, well, they, they weren't even sure what state he was going to land in, you know, and they didn't know if he would survive. Uh, and 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 because, of course, he's not falling through the atmosphere. He's just falling through space effectively. So he breaks the sound barrier. and They didn't know if he would pass out. Um, and um, they, he said afterwards that um, he'd actually got um, damage to his spacesuit. Um, there was a, a nick in like his glove, but and he didn't tell them because he so wanted to do it. He's like, oh, it'll probably be all right. And so his whole hand and arm was freezing, and he's getting frostbite because it, you know, it's so cold up there, and all the air was leaking out of his suit, and he just went ahead and did it anyway. And I, and so I was like, what is this footage? And what is this tune? I didn't, I, I, I didn't know the music before I found the video. And then I just sort of read up on it a bit and I was like, that is just going to be one of the craziest things that any human being has ever done. And it's just very, very beautiful. And the way they use it and cut it to the track. And <coughs> once he lands, there's then this sort of um, pretty cheesy but effective video cut to um, Laird Hamilton, the surfer. So it looks like the guy jumps out of space and then surfs a wave. <laughs> which sounds ridiculously corny, but it actually really works for the music. And uh, yeah, and it's a really nice, they, they use a lot of guitars, but with, you know, synths and, and beats and so on. And I really like the way they use electric guitars, and particularly in this tune. And yeah, so yeah, yeah they got they a very get, like a uh, Johnny Marr Smith's quality to it. And, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. A little bit of a uh, like talk talk, if you know, like Spirit of Eden. Or yeah, some of these records. yeah, yeah. Kind of yeah. That, like Indeed, spacious, yeah, yeah. like right. focused quality, which is really, yeah. really nice, which I like. Um, yeah. Strangely enough, the opening of this actually, because I don't have a lot of like uh, points of reference for exactly for this like specific era, like you mentioned Orbital and the other bands, um, it reminded me of this Tangerine Dream soundtrack from uh, the movie Legend with Tom Cruise, like oh, early yeah. Tom yeah. Cruise. And there's yeah. this track they do with uh, John Anderson from Yes. Somehow I relate these two things in my brains now. So uh, <laughs> now I'm into the boards of Canada if, they're, if I can relate them to Tangerine Dream, which I love. Uh, all right. Well, then the last track on this is obviously like a total kind of just like fun kind of coda <laughs> outro. Yeah, uh, yeah. Super fun band, which uh, I had not heard before. Uh, this kind of like, you know, a uh, klezmer wedding song or something, yeah, you know, yeah. which is mm -hmm. super fun. But do you know these guys? This kind of like uh, uh, so Vulcan UK. I do. Yes. Yeah, so I um, I played with them. I was their percussionist. <laughs> so it's, it's my old band. So they, they <laughs> nice. had to finish off, had to get them in there. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I played um, Darabuka and cymbals and snares and stuff 
um, with this band for a long time, for about, about 10 years. And it was one of the most fun and excellent times of my life. And we did all sorts of different things and many festivals and from very little tiny gigs in bars. And we, you know, we, we toured a bit as well, went, went around the Balkans. And so I, um, you know, learned a lot about Balkan history and traveled around Bosnia and Croatia and uh, Montenegro. And um, we, we played Hungary as well. And we went to Georgia once and did a tour there, which was wow. an amazing experience. And I just learned so much about music and interesting cultures that I did, didn't know anything about um, through this band. And it was just an absolutely fantastic uh, experience and lovely part, part of my life. And um, this was from our second album and we recorded at, at Air Studios. It was recorded by uh, my friend, uh, Fiona Cruikshank, who's an amazing engineer producer. And we recorded it in Studio One at Air, which was quite a scary experience for us as a band because uh, we'd been saving our pennies to go there and do it, but it's an amazing studio. And yeah, as you say, it's, it, this, this one is, is Klezmer and it's yeah, Klezmer sort of wedding, wedding music and just super fun. And yeah, it's just, you know, it's great fun to play that music. and the band played all sorts of different styles so but and this is obviously not specifically Balkan it's more more from the Klezmer tradition um but I you know I Balkan music for me and what I've found out about it I, it just feels a lot like well it is dance music right and a lot of it comes from you know weddings and celebrations and parties and so on but I think it has so much in common with you know electronic dance music with techno and house and so on and like the relentless pounding rhythms uh, but I also really loved um, learning to play in seven and nine and 11 and all that kind of thing. And how those grooves can, you know, initially, like when you're learning to play in seven, it feels lumpy and unnatural. But once you get into it and you don't think and you don't count it and you just feel as it more like a waltz with a long beat sort of thing. It's such a love seven. It's just like such a lovely time signature and so fun to play in. And it almost feels more natural than four. You know, I find it if I'd been playing a few songs in seven, I find it really difficult going back to four, four again. It's like, Oh, this is horrible. This doesn't feel right. Um, <laughs> oh, that's cool, man. I didn't know you were in this group. That's, I mean, it sounds like the, the most fun thing in the world to like play. Yeah, yeah it was to hear this yeah. group play, but also like, if there's no way you could not have a good time while you're like, this group is playing in front of you, you know? <laughs> so Yeah. M many, many gigs and happy times and uh, festivals and, you know, crazy pubs in and around London. And uh, do they still play did, um, or do you all still play? Well, I mean, obviously um, they haven't been able to do anything for the last year because of COVID though. They did do, of course, um, I, I, I left the band a few years ago, um, though I, I still depth with them occasionally and, you know, many, many close friends in that band. Um, and uh, they did do an excellent lockdown video, uh, the multi-screen lockdown thing. So that's on their, their YouTube channel. Uh, and I very much hope that they'll be playing again. I, I think they will. Yeah, I'm sure. TSMB will rise from COVID and <laughs> inflict more Balkan chaos on people. I really hope so. Yeah. Oh, awesome, man. Well, dude, thank you so much. Uh, this has been awesome to chat with you. Um, been awesome, honestly, just to get to know you because I've only known you for a little over a year, a year and a half or so. But uh, yeah. Most of which we've been locked in our houses. I know. <laughs> in different been, continents. Uh, hanging out and <laughs> yeah. uh, doing some, yeah. some COVID like Zoom parties with Tron. And yeah, yeah. Tom. And yeah. It's been just really fun. But uh, yeah, likewise. Yeah, cool, man. Thank you. And uh, well, thank you so much be, uh, for asking safe, me. Man. I really appreciate be, it. Thank you. Be healthy. Yeah, and hopefully, uh, the UK yeah, gets it together. So. <laughs> yeah, well, I think, I think there is light at the end of the tunnel. And, um, and uh, I think the same in, in the States as well, as you say, it seems like everything's in much safer hands now, which is a wonderful thing. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for asking me to do this. It's been really lovely to chat and, and enjoyed it. And I hope, hope people enjoy this very weird and extremely eclectic, <laughs> strange playlist. So yeah, awesome. see, you, see, you, see you on the Zooms again soon. Thank you. Cheers, yeah. man.